This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Eric Canori. How are you, brother? I'm good. Like I told you when I just got here, if I'm still alive, it's a good day. Yeah. So one of America's biggest weed dealers, yeah, he ended up in prison. He ended up doing a deal with 10 million gold bars. Fascinating story. This is why we're on these podcasts, because this is why I love it, because it's interesting. Um, it's good to have you on, American. Very popular. And uh, how are you? Like I said, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm not, uh, you know, I was one of the largest cannabis dealers. There's a lot of there's a lot of big players, but nobody gets the level in the game like me without the government knowing or a gun. Like there's a lot of big players, but they they're double agents or they they're they have government connections. Me, I was a ghost, and that's that's what's so unique to be a ghost. When I got arrested, they didn't even know my name. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time there. Who are you? What are you doing here? That's when you know you've done it right. But then again, you got caught. So I know, can- I know. I know. <laughs> Think about the guys out there right now looking at me like this. This poor boy, he, he got caught. We didn't. Yeah. Before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, Eric, where you grew up, how it all began. It began from pain. It began from being in a place where you don't know if you're going to make it. A place where you're hungry, scared to go home, not knowing where you're going to sleep, drinking out of some stranger's garden hose at night because you're thirsty, but knowing that you have to go home even though it could be abusive or a place you don't want to be. And uh, there's no way out because you can't afford to buy yourself food and you can't afford to buy yourself rent. And you're just a kid and you just have to kind of try to survive and make it. And eventually I started selling candy as a young kid. So I had a little extra money in my pocket, which equaled freedom. But that wasn't enough money to really provide for myself food, shelter, safety. And uh, at a young age, I couldn't fit in with the other kids that well because I didn't have the cool stuff. I didn't have the nice soccer cleats. I didn't have the coolest backpack. So for me, I needed money. Money was the solution to all my problems at a very young age. So tough family upbringing then? Yeah. What about mom and dad? My parents divorced when I was two. My mom remarried shortly after. I grew up with my mom and stepfather. Why is that? Every drug dealer or every criminal, every porn star, every prostitute or OnlyFans, they come from the broken home. After one, yeah. Well, it's because they didn't have they didn't have a stable environment to follow a legal route. A legal route takes support from your family, a healthy, quiet, comforting, and nourishing environment. If you come home and there's rock and roll blaring, or drugs, or yelling, or lack of food in the refrigerator. That's an environment that fosters 
people to partake in our illicit activities, especially if your parents, if your parents are taking partaking in illicit activities, whether it's drugs, any sort of crime, you're naturally going to become a product of your environment, whether you know it or not. We're all sculpted at a very young age, between age and one, between age one and seven, 90% of our personality and who we are is programmed into us. So if you want to know who somebody is when you're talking to them, you have to look back at their childhood. Now, some people can unprogram themselves from that with a lot of work. You got to go deep. For me, it was sitting in a prison cell alone for a couple of years, almost a couple of years. And just looking at all my mistakes, you know, I've had nothing and I've made millions and millions of dollars. And I know what it's like to be in both places. What were you like at school? I had C grades. I passed everything. If I liked the teacher, I excelled. If the teacher didn't know what they were doing, I just spaced out. I didn't listen. But, uh, you know, some teachers, they go to teach because they want the summers off or the good benefits. They're not necessarily there because they want to create top shelf students. They might be there for the good benefits, the easy life. But the teachers that are really there, that are passionate about helping the kids and love their job and are excited, that are really animated in front of the classroom, those are the teachers I gravitated with towards and resonated with that taught me things that I could apply to my real life to, to get what I want in life. Because remember, a knowledgeable person is somebody that knows a lot. Maybe they read a lot in books, but an intelligent person is somebody that knows how to get what they want in life. So back then, I wasn't extremely knowledgeable, but I was very intelligent. What did you do after school? Graduated in uh, graduated high school in 1997, and I went to college for four years, Plattsburgh State University, studied business management, and graduated in 2001. What did you do after that, after graduation? I started a legitimate business building, natural swimming pools, ponds, waterfalls. But I started selling weed at a real young age. That was my main income. I started in uh, 10th grade. Right through college, I sold weed. I became a millionaire shortly after college, age 22. Um, I was very good at what I did. I was good at operating under the radar without the DEA knowing what I was doing. The DEA had a couple kids wear wires on me in college, but uh, I fed them misinformation on the wire, let them on a false trail, and I just they didn't follow me. I was a nobody. So what age did you buy your first bat of weed? Was it two ounces you bought for the first time? Uh, eventually, but it was like an eighth. Yeah, I mean, I bought two ounces in college for my first time, but in high school, maybe in ninth, tenth grade, I bought an eighth dime bag. How much was a ounce back then? Oh man, of shitty weed, hundred and fifty bucks. How but, much did you double your money? Uh, not quite, <clears throat> because I would smoke with everybody. Give it away. <laughs> I would give it away. You think about it. You give it. Away. I was giving a lot away for free to keep people happy and to make friends because I didn't have a lot of friends because I couldn't play sports. So I was accepted more for my, uh, the weed I provided, the good laughs, the party and stuff like that. Do you think that's one of the reasons why you kept doing it is because of the attention you got from having that money and a little bit of power? Yeah. We all want to be loved and recognized for something. It might be for uh, being a good citizen in your community. Yeah. It might be for having a nice car, cool sneakers. For me, it was being able to go out and buy everybody dinner, drinks. Felt good to take care of everybody around me. So you made that. You bought a couple of ounces, sold it, made some friends. How do you then keep doing it? Was it? Did you see a business side of it, and how much money could be made at the start? When I bought my first two yeah. ounces, I knew that there was enough money for me to live comfortably. Not fancy, right? Buy beer, pizza, new sneakers, pants, mm -hmm. little things like that. But the freedom of bypassing, paying taxes, all the red tape like that, it was, it was a cash business. It was, 
I had a great run. I was very good at what I did. I took care of all the customers. I gave them the best price on the street, gave them the best quality that I could find. I always put them ahead of myself. Everybody came ahead of me, my suppliers, my customers. I didn't go to bed till everybody was happy and taken care of. How many bags were you selling per day? Oh my God, in college, in college, I had a lot of small bags, a lot of small customers all throughout town, maybe 20 people a day, 15 people a day. Probably that's about the most I could handle. And that's a busy day. Like you handle 15 people a day, you don't even have to have time to really have a good conversation. And they all want to get high with you too, right? So everybody wants to smoke. How much were you smoking? Oh fuck, like a chimney. <laughs> 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 What what kind of weed? What shitty sort? weed. I first started with shitty weed, but eventually I was getting... Back then, in the late 90s, they called it Kind Bud. There weren't names. It was just called Kind Bud or Shitty Weed was Commercial Bud. But uh, I, uh, I used to get really high. I didn't know people's names. I'd get stupid high. How the fuck did you function? I, I mean, I functioned, but I was just very... Blah. You meet people, the people that smoke weed every day, they're sometimes disassociated with their environment or unaware of their environment completely. They know the basics, right? Got to eat, sleep. But as far as really being present and acute to what's going on around them, I think cannabis, cannabis, if you smoke it a lot, it's going gonna, it's gonna to clog up your neural pathways in your brain. I don't know for sure, but this is science. I've read that somewhere and check, double check, don't quote me, but too much weed's going to gum up your brain. Now, occasionally smoking, if you have pain or something, that's fine, but anybody can do what they want. Me personally, I don't like smoking every day because I get slow, stupid. I'd rather not. I mean, I'd, I'd love to, I love everything about the smell of the plant, the flower, occasionally, maybe smoke it once a year for a special occasion, if I'm with the right people or alone, but I don't abuse anything, even sugar, booze, nothing. I like a, I like to try things here and there and just coast through life. There's so much life has to offer. Why yeah. would I just stop yeah. at weed? Yeah. I smoked weed for 12 years, but I felt that. I felt like you're not in the real world. It's like you escape. I felt slow, sluggish. The skin color changes. People can promote weed and they can say it's a great thing. Listen, there's so many medical benefits from cannabis oil and stuff like that, but people who smoke joints and they're just different their skin colors different they smell different trying to organize things with them that never they never stick to a plan and it's just <clears throat> i don't know man i loved that at the time because it benefited me it just slowed everything down slowed this down but after a few years you just don't really you're not in the real world yeah. i felt for me personally and i know people love it can still go to the gym still function go to work I, I was lazy anyway so that just enhanced that a hundred times yeah but everything the food tasted better everything was funny i was never angry unless i was craving a bit of weed um yeah. but we just used to get high every night now that we're talking about it should we get high tonight bro <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> nah i've been six I, years uh, off it yeah I, I i probably will at some point i am due for a little smoke but it's got to be really tasty something special maybe around a campfire i don't know something we'll see i don't know i just don't crave anything my favorite thing is mushrooms and i don't even crave those right now what about ayahuasca yeah i've done that about nine times but i'm scared to go again I last time went really deep so i don't know if i need it it's still in me like i feel it i feel it in me and it's been a year that's a long time yeah i just feel it i just feel like when i work out and stuff i tap into that spot Mm -hmm. And I just, I activate all the channels because I went big the last time. I told the shaman, I go, I, I don't come anymore because I'm not feeling it. And he really gave me a lot. And basically it helped me with all areas of my life. Normally ayahuasca will hit one area, maybe fitness or business or health, you know, health. But this, it hit everything. Family, money, relationships, gut health, all areas of my life that needed improvement. It just said reset everything but it took me down to my knees bro it cut my ego in half and i was just laying there on the floor melted out just like a nobody a speck in the universe 
realizing what's important in life. You know, just remind it's stuff that we already know, but it just reminded me that, you know, time's short here. Become the best version of yourself. Cut all the cut out all the shit that does not serve your higher purpose. And that could be the food you eat, the friends you hang out with, the people you do business with, the people you love. The rooms and environments you place yourself in. You, you are a product of your environment. And that environment has to do with thoughts, people, spaces, everything. So it's like, I, I want to go to the top. I want to feel good. And in order to do that, I need to cultivate an environment that's healthy. When did you start moving through the ranks and selling bigger bits? <clears throat> uh, I started young. When I, started, when I, was, I really started moving where I had extra money in my pockets to well when i was age probably 23 i stopped counting my money i became a millionaire 21 22 and then by 23 by age 25 i started weighing the money where it's kind of or you just not even weigh it more just look at the stacks and think about you know if somebody says it's a million bucks you look quick and you say yeah, okay yeah that's a million bucks you don't check every dollar and occasionally you'll check it to make people sure people are correct and not playing any games. But, um, I was, I, my, I moved in through the ranks very steadily. My, my drip, it was a steady, easy ascent for me in the game. Very skilled, polished, quiet, humble, very picky with who I do business with. I always kept my mouth shut. And any of my girlfriends, they didn't know what I was doing. They knew I had money in my pocket, but they didn't know the details of when a deal was going down, what type of deals I did. They just knew I had money and things were taken care of. What was your first biggest, what was your first big shipment? Mm. Probably the first, where I considered it a bigger shipment, probably around age 22, quarter million dollar deal. How many kilos? Oh, back then, back then, that's only, with the high-end product, that's only 50 kilos or less. We don't do the metric system, it's pounds, but yeah. Where were you sourcing your, your, your gear from? For a, for a decade, I was pulling it out of Canada. Why Canada? Because that's where all the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, that's where the largest indoor cultivation facilities were located. I think the laws were less strict up there. What was the laws for weed back yeah, then? I, I never knew the laws in Canada. I never understood. I just don't think they prosecuted it as much. They would just take old factories and renovate them and turn them into massive grow houses, hundreds of thousands of square feet all over the place. How much was it to set up a grow? That wasn't my specialty. My specialty is only smuggling. So you weren't growing them yourself? Never grew weed. That hundred percent profit. Did you ever think about going down that route, or was it just too easy getting it from someone nah. and passing it on? I didn't like the <clears throat> cultivation because if you have heat from the feds, you can't move your facility. If any time I have heat, I can quickly move my whole operation within a matter of hours. You know, whether I have to st dump stash houses, move inventory, like there's so many different things. But you know, if you have a grow facility, you can't move anything. The only thing you can do is burn it. So see, when you're making money, the kid that comes from the broken home, quite unhappy, quite lonely, what was it feeling like when you started making some serious paper? It came a little fast, so I was too young to really embrace all the things that money could do for me. Money, really, I spent it on stupid. Well, I didn't spend a lot of it on stupid. I spent it on people. I just gave, I just invested in people's, handshake agreements and business ideas oh i have a business idea let's let's shoot a documentary i spent two million bucks without a contract just blew money on stupid stuff like that or let's invest in this real estate endeavor and throw a million bucks into that without a contract so i just threw a lot of money around it it felt good it felt good to go to bed at night knowing that i didn't have to worry about how i was going to eat and where i was going to sleep did you feel used? No, I didn't. Get, not to. I never got to that point. Not till after I got arrested, where I had time to reflect. I just. I. I was so deep in the business that things were constantly moving around me that there was never time to stop, breathe, reflect, and think about who I was, what I was doing, why I was doing it. I was just a robot in the system. Make money, make money, make money. 
How much were you making per month at the height of it? The height, I was probably bringing in. I was probably doing per month probably seven hundred grand profit. Probably maybe a little less. I never counted how much I made per month. It was always per year. Per year around Christmas time, I didn't go home to my family much during Christmas. So when everybody was doing Christmas, that's when I would like check my net worth. I kind of did that myself. It was kind of my Christmas present to myself. So I'd tally up what I had on the street, what I had buried, what I had in inventory, and that's how I'd figure out my net worth once a year. Was that a lonely journey for you? That part of it was, but when I get lonely, I just call an escort. Yeah, you liked your hookers, huh? Yeah, I liked... Yeah, I liked... I don't know if I'd call them hookers, but I guess you could call them that. But I liked... I just liked female attention, right? It's hard to... Sometimes it's hard to have a girlfriend in that business because you never know where you're going to be and you you can't explain to your girlfriend where you're going to be. They'll start asking questions, be like, why are you being shady? So for me, there was phases in my life where it was just easier to call a girl when I needed to see a girl and it could be just a back scratch. It doesn't, it's not always sex. It could be just talking. It depends on what the connection is. Did you just need someone there? Well, I love, I needed, I had friends, but I needed, uh, you, I need female energy in my life every week. How much were you paying? Uh, depends. I mean, if, if she drove to me and got a car service, I might spend 5000 to have a girl come to me for the evening, and then I'd pay her travel expenses. Five bags? It must be top dollar then. It depends. It depends. I've gotten top shelf girls for 600 bucks, Top shelf. And then I've gotten girls for 5000 that I was not attracted to, and I was just like kind of told them to, you know, go home. And I still gave them the 5000 just out as a courtesy, and I didn't want to have any problems, you know, so... But it's uh, some girls have run down. You know, you, if you're an escort long enough, it can run you down. You're drinking wine with your clients. You just get unhealthy. But some escorts really take it seriously as a business, and they don't drink. They don't do drugs. And they just stay healthy and work out and healthy, healthy diet. I mean, it depends. And some girls come here straight from Europe, come here to New York City, and... They're beautiful, healthy, and it's easy, quick money. It's a quick way to integrate in yourself into American society. If you have good looks, you can make money. That's the bottom line. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's, I mean, come in, if you're a girl in your 20s with good looks, you can quickly come into New York City and make a half a million cash a year, no problem, just to start. Have you ever been in love? Yeah. When? Uh, maybe three or four times, but I've only had one girlfriend that's really... I've only had one girlfriend where I like teared up over. It was painful. Really yeah, just because I loved her. She was, she was, she was a good girl. She'd take a bullet for me. Yeah. What happened? I went to prison. Uh, she was a little older than me. She, I ended up. It was just a difficult time in my life. It was just difficult. She's still a good girl. I like her. I, I just, she's not for me anymore. This is going back what, 12, 15 years ago. Do you struggle to keep relationships, friendships, love? No. Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, I, I would have had. How I would, do you know who's genuine if you're paying 5000 if you're spending money, investing into people? For me, that's you being used, whether you like to believe it or not. You've got to, because anything in life to be successful is lonely. I'm here, it's lonely. But I just know it's taking me to the next level, the next level. But what is the next level? It's just all in here. But it's, it becomes lonely and then. But for you, you just seem to be investing into all these people who were the wrong people without people truly understanding you and seeing you for who you were and asking you about your childhood or asking you about life. It seemed to have been you who was <clears throat> putting their hand in a pocket. For me, that's somebody that's, that's not the right, that's not what friends do, that's not what love is, in my own opinion. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, um, a lot of people, a lot of people use me, but it's taken me sitting alone for a long time to now be able to walk up to somebody and pr pretty quickly be able to tell if they're genuine. Genuine. You, you know, when you hang out with somebody, there's only two ways you can feel after you hang out with them. 
either charged or drained. So anybody that I go see after, if I feel tired, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. It's no disrespect for them. They're just in a different place in life or a different path, unless it's somebody that really needs my help, right? Like somebody in the hospital or something. That's a different story. But general, just like everyday life, people that just, nothing's more important than your gut feelings. I mean, your, your, your mind's okay, but your gut comes first. Then your gut sends the signal to your heart, and then your heart sends the signal to your brain. So you really have to follow your gut with everything that you're doing. And don't listen to people. Don't listen to people that are telling you how to live life unless they've, unless they've done it. I don't take business advice for people that have never run a business successfully. I don't take relationship advice from people who are divorced. I just take advice yeah. from people who are doing it and I like and uh and uh yeah, I mean, life of a drug dealer. <laughs> a good life shit yeah. man you know what i'm saying it's a good run you know what i like you ever seen the, the original tv show miami vice in yeah. the late 80s yeah don johnson those suits his white linen suits mm -hmm. and just like chasing the bad guy like yeah for me i don't care if if i was the good guy or the bad guy i just like the chase that's all it is, I think, is the chase. I had a mafia guy on today, and he was just saying it's like the life of crime and the glorifying the gangsters and the mafia. It's all bullshit. They all snitch on each other. They all kill each other. They're all fucking each other's wives. There's just no loyalty in it, but yet it's glorified. But yet when you're in that life, it's sexy. You feel important, but it's it's just an ego trip. It's all bullshit. It's all an illusion. Yeah. It's all fake. But yet we create it in here so much, but... It's mad. Where was you? Where were you supplying to? All along the East Coast. I pull mostly out of Canada, bring it to New York State. I had a, multiple warehouses in the country, and then uh, from there, I'd have my driver smuggle it down the East Coast, every single state: Carolinas, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, Florida, a little bit, New Orleans, uh, even all the way out to St. Louis. And uh, I didn't distribute it locally. I didn't ever sell locally in my town because I didn't want any heat. I had my legitimate little business building natural swimming pools, ponds, waterfalls, tiny little thing, nothing big. But that was my cover. So when I go out to eat in town or anything I do, they just they don't know anything. I'm just a nobody. Nothing flashy, no, no jewelry, low-key car. And I liked it that way. Yeah, I love that. That's a, that for me is what it's about if you're in that lifestyle everybody yeah. i know are getting fucking porsches and lamborghinis range rovers 50 grand watch and you think it's just calling out for a prison sentence yeah because it does it gets the better of you because you want to compete you want to show people you're doing well but it's the ones who fly under the radar it's the ones who are quiet it's the ones who are working in the pool job and just think you're an average joe who fly under the radar for me that's what for me if, if i was to be active again it would in touch with they'll never be but it would to be <clears throat> just being a nice guy next door yeah it's crazy though that so, everybody goes flash why did you keep it so calm for someone who craved attention and wanted friends as well why did you just i watched in the miami vice that's the, what you got the tv show when i when i was a kid and when mm -hmm. i was a teenager i'd watch it and it was always the guys that had the fancy cars big mansions that the dea went after the D, you don't want to make them jealous. That's what it comes down to. A lot Jealousy. Of them, yeah. A lot of them are jealous because they're working, busting their ass, putting their life online every day for somebody to be fucking rubbing in their face. Yeah. Because they'll think, I'm going to get him. Yeah. So that's where you got the inspiration to fly under the radar in Miami base. Yeah. I learned a lot from there, how the judges work, how the lawyers work, what wires are. I mean, when you're 15 years old and you understand like what an indictment is or undercover work how it works how they follow license plates surveillance all this stuff i picked up from those shows and then i learned more on my own just through trial and error as i got bigger in the game so you're just flying totally under the radar how much how many kilo were you bringing in per month mm. <clears throat> i don't know about weight but i was doing probably let's say i was doing 60 million a year in sales what's that about five million a, a month 
five million a month, I would say. That's at my peak. Right? It didn't start out like that, but there was I had probably a good three years where I was running at that level. When I got arrested, things were slowing down leading up to it. The market was getting flooded. California was flooding the East Coast. You know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, weed wasn't as popular. There wasn't as much of a supply. Then come two thousand eight, two thousand nine, the supply increased dramatically in the United States because they were more lenient in California. And California was pumping out metric tons and tons. How many people did you have working with you? Mm. I only had a tight crew, maybe four or five drivers that I'd rotate through. I had maybe one warehouse guy for managing inventory, uh, one just general runner guy that would do anything I needed on the side. So what do you think? Maybe five, six people? Like they kind of just, but no, no one person, not one lieutenant of mine knew everything about my organization. So if anybody got arrested at any time, they couldn't, they could only tell what they knew. I, I, I knew everything, but didn't tell any one person. I used to do a bit of weed back in the day. And the thing about weed, it was always cash. It was always cash in hand. There was never any dramas. I never had dramas when I done weed, ever. It's always cash. But when you're doing the bigger bits, like yourself, was there any people try to fuck you over? Not when I was in the game. I'm. I got robbed once. I got robbed out of a. From my house, about a half million when I was away. Cash. No inventory, but they sold it for cash. That happened. I've had. Uh, Why did you keep it in your house? I, I was just sloppy. I was. I had to catch a flight, and I didn't have time to move it to another place. So I was just taking shortcuts. There's times. When I spread myself thin, and I didn't follow my own protocols and procedures, so I would just take shortcuts. When you take shortcuts, those are all the times that I get in trouble and just sloppy. How were they wrapped with the smell? Was there any smell coming off? Everything them? was vacuum sealed. So no smell, no, no trace? No, but they can make those dogs jump to anything. If they suspect it, they just kick the dog in the leg and it'll jump. Mm -hmm. You know how they do it. Yeah. So see, when you're doing it then, you're making millions, you're, everything's above board. When did it come on top then? How did you end up getting caught? If you seem to have... 2009, my business was plateauing and declining at the same time, I guess you could say. Well, declining. And... uh I was just trying to hold it together while I was trying to get out of the business at the same time. But there's just so many moving parts that it was hard to get out. I'd had millions fronted on the street, a few million in inventory, prepaid orders. There's so many moving parts that I couldn't just collect everything at once and walk away. So it was a struggle that I faced on a daily basis. But uh, my margins were shrinking. My customers were complaining my prices were getting too high. So I decided to t take a ride out to California and uh, reaching out, trying to figure out where all the new weed was coming from. Because I didn't know anything about California. I only knew about Canada. There's a lot of growers out there growing boutique weed, really nice stuff. And uh, I decided to start sourcing from there. So I set up a little warehouse, a little bit of transportation to get to the East Coast. But it wasn't professional transportation. I hired this uh, female mountain biker, Missy Giovi. She's one of the fastest mountain bikers at the time. And I hired her to drive the load. I paid her 60000 to drive it. But she tricked me and subbed the job out to her massage therapist for 3000 Didn't tell her what was in the back of the truck. For, you know, just She got caught speeding, pulled over, searched the truck, put GPS unit on it. The truck, they filed the truck to my property in upstate New York where they found me and arrested me. Found a million and a half in my, well, between both my houses, a couple million in cash. And uh, they wanted me to work undercover, but I wouldn't do it. They just they said, you have a small window to cooperate. Nobody knows we're here. Just get on with your life. And I didn't do it. So they arrested me, throw me in jail. I respect that, though. Yeah, they got bailed out. They were following me around, trying to see who I was, who I knew, what I was doing. I had a lot of money in the streets. I had to try to connect, collect that, and I'd tie up loose ends. It was difficult with all that heat on me at the moment. Because the American gangster, do you remember, <clears throat> they went to the boxing, and I think she bought him a mink coat, and that was the moment that says, who is he? Ringside, 50 grand coat. 
and that's what drew attention to him. It's mad how, because they're always watching one mistake, and it's caught like you, flew under the radar, had it perfect, but yet one mistake and it wasn't from you. Well, it was from you as well, because you should have been more on it with the driver to make sure they were going. Instead, you had someone else. But what was the feeling like when you get caught? Because you're such a, I don't know if that's an act, like you're so laid back. You're like a laid back character. Has that always been? Yeah, I've your, always been Your really presence kind of, yeah. you don't give away much. If yeah. you know what I mean, that's just, I don't know if that's. No, it's what, true. You wouldn't know that I was in the business. No you way. wouldn't know what the fuck you were doing anything because you don't give much away. There's look, look at me. You can't figure out what I have nothing to say. I have a haircut, black <laughs> shirt. I'm just, <laughs> fucking, what the fuck? And a few fucking 10 out of 10 girls on your phone book. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I uh, I was a quiet guy and I still am. And I don't even do anything wrong right now. But you take the same principles from the street and you apply them to the legitimate world. It's the same stuff. You stay quiet. You do slow, steady wins every day. Slow, steady business. Take care of all the people around you. Suppliers, customers. Put everybody up ahead of yourself you know that's how you really win be a man of your word my my word is more important than all the money in the world like i don't owe anybody a penny and i feel good about that did the police come through your door or did they watch you first before no. they jumped on you no they just picked me up right there picked me up and they, they searched my house illegally they had a weak case i fought them for a couple of years then i got rearrested for laundering money to pay my lawyer i couldn't i didn't have the money and they froze my bank account so i couldn't pay my lawyer they allegedly say I was laundering money to pay my lawyer. I didn't get charged with that because at a later date, I uh, the feds wanted me to work undercover for them and set people up. But eventually I made a deal where I decided to basically set myself up. So I went out in the woods in shackles because I was rearrested a second time for laundering money to pay my lawyers, allegedly. And uh, the deal I made with them the second time is if you really want money, I'll get you some money. That's when I went out in shackles in the woods. They escorted me, and I dug up close to $10 million in gold bars I buried. I gave it to them. How much less did you get off your sentence? I don't know. It's hard to say. If I had to guess, maybe eight, nine, ten years. Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. If I had to guess eight years, is that worth it? One million a year? Yeah. Your freedom's everything for me. People would have probably done the eight years for the 10 million, but for me, money can always be made. Time can never always be. Time can never be bought. It can never be replaced. Time can never be replaced, but like I say, money can always be made. So uh, for me, it's the right decision. If it's your last 10 million, it's a difficult one, but for me, 100%. If you're getting eight years off your sentence, fucking give it up, man. 10 million, no problem. I'll make that back when I'm out next time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what was that feel? So who would they, who would they want you to give up when you get caught? They want you to just keep working. <clears throat> buy it from who you buy it from and sell it to whoever you sell it to. And then they do all their work behind the scenes. Would you have had to wear a wire or anything? I didn't even ask. I didn't even get that far. So yeah. I just know it's basic, <clears throat> basically the way it works is I would have taken that load and went and sold it to wherever maybe brought them the money back and then they would have watched that person for a while and got them at a later date i don't know how they have all different strategies mm -hmm. but for me it was uh now granted i had to sit down i told them what i did did you just can't lie to them it's like you can't lie but you don't have to tell them everything that's my deal in my contract basically tell us what you did give us this much money and that's it. And they still sentenced me to a little less than two years in prison. But, well, I got, yeah, I got, I did almost two years. What was that like in prison for the first night? Mm, well, it depends when. The first time I got arrested, it was relaxing because nobody was calling me. I didn't have any, I didn't have to be a boss. I didn't have to take care of things. I just passed out. But eventually, I didn't mind the alone time. I just didn't like the food. There was good food. That would be like going to a retreat, right? Get your mind right, work out, mm -hmm. reset, think about what you want to do in life, think about your purpose. Keep your gold bars. Fuck yeah. it, I don't want to leave here. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. 
yeah, you know, it's, I can make money back. I just need a good team. That's all it is. It's, the thing is, it wasn't the money that I lost my team. I lost a good team of people. I'll never, I can't go back to those people, but we had a good operation. I had to weed through hundreds of people over the years to get a core team of people that knew how to think like me and execute when I wasn't there the way I'd want it to be done. And trust. Trust, yeah. Trust is a key one. Huh? Yeah, yeah, trust. Yeah, just be able to front somebody a million dollar load knowing they'll come back yeah. in a week. That's hard to do now. Yeah. I have to have lawyers for little $10,000 deals. I'm like, what the fuck is this? You know, it's just like people are chasing money down for... Three thousand bucks right now. I have somebody, somebody that owes me for a contract three thousand dollars. Are you serious? Like, I just, I'm not used to that, but it's okay. So why buy the gold? Obviously, when you're burying money, people might not know, but money can it can go moldy. It can stick together. You can lose money if you bury it. Well, UK notes, I know, but maybe dollars are different. So, what was the meaning behind the gold bars? Because you know, it would hold its value as well. Maybe price would go up plus. It wouldn't disappear unless someone knew where it was buried. What was the meaning behind having gold, gold? Gold is mainly because it holds its value against inflation, usually. Yeah. Not always. I think It's went up, gold, copper, everything. Prices always go up. It probably should be higher, though, don't you think? Should yeah, of course. Should be higher right now? But it's how it plays with the market, can play about with the stock. So yeah. I don't really know too much about it. I just know gold does hold its price, same as Rolexes. Um, was that the meaning behind it? Because you knew you wouldn't lose if you kept the gold? Mm. Or was that a bigger meaning behind it? Wait, meaning behind what? When you got the gold instead yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. I, I bought the gold, though, because you can't... The cash loses value. If I just saved cash, it wouldn't be... I mean, well, how much has gold gone up in the past 10 years? I don't know. Uh, I don't even know. Like 80%, 60%? I'm not sure, but it holds its value. Anybody that's burying $100 bills... You go dig that up in 10, 20 years, it's not going to be worth much. Probably won't even have cash around in 10, 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. How hard was the decision to give them? 10 million worth of gold, was that an easy decision? It was hard. I didn't even give it to them all at once. I gave them 5 million at first, five point, a little less than five, I think. I gave them five at first just to see how I could trust them. Where was the gold? In the Adirondacks, New York, foothills of the Adirondacks, upstate New York in the woods. Any people could have been walking over that every day? Depends where it was. There were a few different spots. But yeah, anybody could. Yeah. What were you thinking when you were It was there? deep. It was deep. So it was like it would be hard to pick up a <clears throat> metal detector. Did you ever think it could have sank as well? Because obviously when you let's see you have coffins, you're burying the dead. Sometimes they just keep... I'm not that I'm burying dead bodies, but I mean if you're putting yeah. someone down in a coffin, <clears throat> they, they keep sinking. Did you ever worry that... No, I never could... even knew that. I didn't know that. Yeah, right. because it's in mud. Oh, I guess it was in mud. But yeah, the places I put this in were rocky or soil. I mean, it would look pretty stable to me. So mm -hmm. it was... Uh... Yeah, I only gave him $5 million. I gave him the other $6 million because... Uh... Well, I gave him close to $12 million in cash and gold. But I, I gave him 5 at first, and then another 6 and a half. A few weeks later, so they wouldn't press me to work for them because they just want always more. I made a deal and then they want more. Who are you getting it from? Where are you doing it? Do this, set this person up, all this stuff. And I just, so I, I, I had to build trust with them. I gave them a little at a time to see how the trustworthy they could be until I made a deal that felt right and fair to me. Could you have not made that deal the first five million to get it in paper, decent lawyer? Sign this, low sentence, two years out and about. No, maybe, maybe from day one, if my lawyers, I could have got a deal for maybe two million plus two years in prison, but I missed that opportunity. I didn't even know that to opportunity exists. One of my lawyers actually didn't let me know about it, which I was a little disappointed, but I probably wouldn't have taken it anyway, so I understand why they didn't let me know. But, uh, I had a strong case. They illegally searched my home, but then I got rearrested a second time and my case was weaker when I was laundering the money, allegedly, to pay my lawyers. So it was a battle, bro. And I was only, what, 30 years old, 31, 32, and I was just young and didn't have experience on negotiating with the law. Mm -hmm. I All I knew was I was good in the streets and I knew if I ever got in trouble that I would go down with the ship. I wasn't going to take and just start setting up all the people around me that helped me from the bottom, you know? 
Yeah, I respect that though. I've got massive respect for you for not snitching. I've people just turn queens and just start snitching on everybody to get lower sentences. If you're in a life of crime, you've got to fucking stick by it. You've got to handle whatever's coming to you, no matter if you've been set up to be put in prison or put in prison because you deserve there. If you start turning and switching, that's just, for me, that's not right. No matter what's done. If you're in a life of crime, accept it, man up. Accept what's coming. Like, too many pussies, man. Too many bitches. Not just in every... Yeah, that's why I'll life. never go back. I'll never go back because I know that the majority of all the people I worked with have folded in a second. <clears throat> they would have. I've, I've saw a lot of people fold that I didn't think would. The girl, Missy Jovi, that she folded in a second. Like, she... She crushed me. I actually didn't think she would. I didn't think she would fold, but she was she was all talk. She runs her mouth and she just lies a lot. Um What one what one was this? The sixty grand girl to drive? Yeah. Yeah, women would fold in a minute. We'll, we'll take your mum and dad's house, we'll take your kids. They just crumble. Men yeah. crumble easy. Yeah. So women it's, it's there's not many staunch women who would fucking stand and take the punishment. You get through under the bus straight away. Yeah. Do you think yeah. you can be too trustworthy then? But you seem very calculated, though. I'm calculated, but I'm not using that. I'm not using my skills in the underworld anymore. My skills are now going into the legal world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set up. I'm going to set up a company right now that can scale. I'm going to map it out this winter. And I'm going to start building it come spring, summer. If you're looking for a business partner, brother, you know where I am. All right, I'm a winner. What do you want to do? Anything you want, weed, heroin, cocaine. <laughs> 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 uh, Whatever yeah. you want. And it, this is what I always tell people. Everything is possible. Everything is limitless. Well, I want to do I want to do uh, really high-end off-grid retreats, places where people can reset and recharge, where they plug in. You know, we plug our phones into charge. We plug our cars into charge. Mm -hmm. But the human body isn't being plugged into spaces that charge us. And I'm going to build spaces that charge you in harmony with the earth and nature, the sun, really chic and sexy, yeah. but very natural and healing. Yeah, I love that. With grounding, sun gazing, natural foods, yeah. Yeah, meditation, cold water therapy, everything grown from the earth. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. That's what humans should be, man. Yeah. But we're not. We're disconnected because we chase money. We chase fame. We chase <clears throat> alcohol, women. It's all low vibrational, man. Yeah. What was it like being in prison then? How did you handle that? <clears throat> that was good for me. I worked on my business plans. Mapped things out. I just didn't like the food. How were you treated in prison? Because Fine. Quite... People, people like me. Uh, yeah, because you I had quite... the best. I had the best cell in our unit. I had... Yeah, I had people get me good food from the kitchen, extra chicken, extra eggs. I was treated well. What prison were you in? I moved around. I was in a couple different jails in upstate New York. I was in two different prisons. But where I spent the most of my time was in FMC Devon's federal prison. Very easy. It was like a medium. It was a medium, and there was a satellite camp on the side of it. So it was easy. I was like in a camp for most of the time. But I spent time in the hole. I spent... Why? A little over a month in the hole, getting moved around. Why? Just that's just protocol when they're moving you around and stuff. And and when I first got arrested, they put me in a shitty cell and uh, for four months trying to get crack me, get me to work for them. Fold, collapse. But that's all in my book. I explain in the book how I how I navigated my deal with the government. Like I recommend reading the book. If yeah, your book's called Pressure. Pressure, a memoir by Eric Canori. Yeah, we'll leave the link in the description. Because it's weed as well. It's not, it's not, a, is it classes in America the same as UK, A, B? Like, obviously, cocaine's a class A, heroin. Because weed is not, it's not as if you're a stone cold killer as well. So, I'd imagine you'd have got better prisons, better treatment. Um, class A, category prisoners, we call them in yeah. the UK, where they're, they're ruthless and they have to get fucking chauffeured around with guys and guns because they're so dangerous. You know what I mean? Because it's weed as well, it's not. What is the what's the biggest sentence you can get for weed supplying? I was looking for my crime five to forty years. What? Yeah. For weed? The judge hopefully wouldn't go that high, but <laughs> the laws are strict. Still in New York, it's it's still in the United States, cannabis is federally legal schedule schedule one drug. If they really want to, if you get caught with over 100 kilos of cannabis right now illegally, I mean, you can pay. You're going to, they could get federal time on you, but they're not going to really do that anymore. But 
They're going to change the laws in New York. There's some things going on, and not in New York, in the United States. So he says you were in prison that gave you a lot of time to reflect on your life. What sort of stuff were you thinking about? Uh, who I want to associate, what's important, what I want to do before I die, being thankful for what I have, trying to enjoy every day. I'm all done hoping for a beautiful <laughs> retirement. Oh, I'm when I'm old, I'm going to retire, I'm going to live on a beach. No, fuck no. I'm going to live I'm going to fucking be on a beach now. So every day I work a little and I play a little like it's my last day. I don't live on a beach, but I make sure every day or every other day I get to go swimming outside somewhere, whether it's winter or summer. And I make sure I spend a little time and slow down, but I still work hard. I still put in 10-hour days of work at least. But I also play a little at the end of the day. One thing I cut out is I don't party. I don't drink. I don't do drugs because that, that slows you down. Like, I, I don't need to. What the fuck am I going to do? Go drink some beers and laugh about a bunch of shit I'll forget about tomorrow? What sort of drugs were you taking? Oh, Coke? I tr I've tried everything as a kid, but really it was just... Coke and booze? Nah. I really like pills. I like pills. Ecstasy? Ox well, I've took some, some of that. Not a lot. But I just like downers, like pharmaceuticals, oxycotons, oxycodones. Percocets, I like that stuff. Very easy to take, relaxing, but I don't do any of that shit. It's been years. Yeah, that stuff just fucking numbs your brain. Yeah. You become a zombie. What was the steps to get out of prison? Did you do you get a you out in license like the UK or how does it work? How do you what? Get out of prison? <clears throat> yeah, how what was the steps to get out of prison? They got me out quick. I, I, I that's in my book too, it's complicated, but I had an appeal. I was appealing an aspect of my case because technically it was illegal. Because of this, de the, it's complicated. It's called an Ogden memo. The scheduling of cannabis shouldn't be a Schedule One. It should be a Schedule Three because there are some medical benefits. So my lawyer had some thing that he was fighting. So I got out pretty quick. I got out. I got out like uh, less than two years. I got out a couple months early. It's very easy. You get out. Somebody picks you up at the courthouse, you go home, you sit on supervised release for five years. Basically, supervised release is you pee in a cup whenever they call you. You tell them how much money you spend, how much money you make. You tell them if you're leaving the state. I, I hated supervised release. I just hate being checked up on, but whatever. It was what I had to do. Now I'm free. This is the first time in my life where I'm finally free. Like, like right now, like this month. This might be my last interview, by the way. Why? Yeah, I just I don't want to talk about my story anymore. It's the past. I have new shit to focus on. I don't really like this. I've said this story so many times that I'm over it. Like I'm done. Yeah. Like I don't even want to think about it. It like built me. It got me to where I'm at. Like I learned a lot of lessons, but this is all, this is old era crime bullshit. Like, yeah, I get it. I'm going to build these health retreats, man. Yeah. I understand that. Like you see, there's got to be a time you flip the chapter. There's some people can tell their story for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And you're thinking, what have you done? Anything new? Yeah. You know, there's yeah. only so much shit people can listen to all the time without bringing something new to the table so listen i totally get that and i respect that that it's good that you're thinking that way as well because it's fucking draining talking about your pain in the past and fucking shagging yeah, it's a lot of work brass bro. and fucking giving up 10 million gold bars i would never want to repeat that yeah i'm done i'm fucking i paid the money i got <clears throat> kicked around i learned a lot of shit and I had a lot of things going on in the last 10 years, man. I've been airlifted to the ICU a couple times for reckless accidents. I've just had a lot of shit where I just had a lot of time to sit alone. I'm 44 now, man. I'm like, you know what? I just closer to the end than the beginning. It's like it's time to really live for me, right? You know, wake up every day, good intentions, be a good person, and build a, le a, a legal business that helps people's lives and have fun doing it and have cool people involved. You can have a good time. Like have it all as one. I don't like to separate life like nine to five and then it's the weekend and we play and party like no every day have a good time little work little play let's build a better world together and have a good time how many people visited you when you i didn't want visitors why it makes time go too slow because then when they leave you miss them i don't like visitors i had a couple family members come just to update me on my business activities let me know how the outside world's going say hi give them a hug no, I don't like visitors. I like letters. Do you think that's what you are about? Just kind of blocking things out and never really speaking? Have you ever? When was the last time you cried? Cried? Uh, I cried when my dog died years ago. I did, there was this one girl I dated that I teared up a little over. 
recently. Just a little, just like a little like felt and it felt good. Just like I was driving. And there was this little time, something with my father and family. I was driving home from a family event. I've only probably cried five times in 20 years. But there was this family event this past year I drive home from. And I was like, wow. I was driving home at like one o'clock in the morning. It's dark on the highway by myself. And I was like, and it hit me. I was like, I really don't have any family. And I teared up for a minute. I was just like, holy shit, I'm, I'm doing this life alone. Because like, I know my family, but I'm just not close with them. That's a whole long story. It was a, it's a whole long story. So it's like I just accepted I'm in this life alone, bro. You know, it's just it. But I'm thankful to be alive. Imagine how many people that have family that are miserable in it. At least I'm not miserable. I'm just at I'm at peace. I'm not I wouldn't say I'm happy, but I'm at peace. When when's the last time you were happy? Happy? Shit. I don't even know what happy is. <laughs> <laughs> No wonder you take so many fucking pills, bro. <laughs> the block out fucking pain, mate. I think you should get back dealing, mate. Get high, mate. Fucking, that's what I believe, mate. Because you fucking, mate. You're forty-four. Your life ain't fucking over. No, no, but uh, what's happening? Listen, I'm at peace. What's happening? Fuck peace. What's happening? Why do I go through life at peace, Look, mate? Okay, all right, all right, all right. I might. I think I'm on an upswing right now. I think. I think this might be my last interview, mm -hmm. and things are gonna go uphill for me because I don't want to talk about this shit anymore. Yeah, yeah, get it's it. It's fucking over, bro. I fucking <laughs> a big deal. I sold fucking weed. I was good at it. Mm -hmm. I'm a businessman. I'm not a criminal. I'm a fucking businessman. Mm -hmm. What about having kids? Nah, is that playing in your I'm mind? I'm an old man now, man. It's like what? what? Robert De Niro just had one at fucking eighty-five. Oh, really? How old's how old's the girl? The Thirty. Thirty. That's <laughs> good. Do I want to I mean? see a picture of that. I'll the, pull that up for me when we move yeah, down here. It's a uh, yeah. Listen, for me, family's everything. We can chase. Uh, that's just because there's so many fuck ups that I've done in the past. The bad stuff. The feeling sorry for myself. The blaming everybody else. But for me, it's. It's family. The reason I work so hard is, is to provide for my kids. I, nothing else really matters. And That's me, awesome. Yeah. That's, I respect that because for me, I was always afraid to have kids because of what I was doing. I would never want my kids to be around that. Mm -hmm. Now that I don't break the law anymore, that could happen. But for me, it's like I never want them exposed to my life. My life was unstable. Yeah. We had a hitman on, a hitman on today and... His son's in prison. He lost his daughter last year to overdose. <clears throat> and that's his biggest regret. He wasn't there enough for his family. He chose a life of crime. He chose friends who he fought with, friends who fucked him over. And just, there's too many broken homes now. And I've interviewed enough people to understand coming from a broken home raises your chances of going to prison, being a drug dealer, getting involved in crime and being involved in a sex trade. And fucking, it's sad because... <clears throat> As men and female, we should only have one partner as well, but we're living a, a life where it's porn and prostitutes and it's easy to get laid. You've got fucking dating apps. <clears throat> we're losing ourselves as human beings. We are so lost from what we should be, and that's being in a higher power and a good vibration. It's all shite foods, and it's just people are confused, and it's not that they're bad. It's just all they've been taught. And it's try to unwire that to understand you've got greatness in you. You can do anything you want in your life. But if you've done something for 10, 20, 30 years of doing bad shit, it doesn't change overnight. People can't reprogram that. It takes years and years of changing it. And that's the painful thing. Would you change anything from the past? I really don't know. I, there's nobody I personally know that I'd trade lives with. I, I don't think. I don't know. My life. But what you said, I was programmed it, I was in that underworld for 15 years, at least, maybe a little longer when you count doing the prison time and all that. But it's taken me just as long, 14 years, to deprogram myself. I'm finally, finally, probably this month, I can officially say I'm breaking free from all the past. It's taken me 14 years to reprogram, and it's work. You got to be like down for exercising and eating right and no, saying no to people that aren't good for you. And like all that shit is discipline. Every single day you have to wake up with a purpose and be disciplined to stay on track. Nobody can do it for you. You can spend money on gurus and fucking consultants and doctors, but I've tried that route, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and the best stuff I've learned is 
for free, being alone in nature and collecting your thoughts because you only you know what's best for you. You're not stupid. Everybody knows what's best for themselves. It's just sometimes I get it. You do need to talk to people because it does help. Nobody wants to be alone. I have a high threshold for being alone in pain just because I spent so much time alone as a kid, grounded and trapped. So I can handle it. I don't, I'm not saying it's good to do. You should have a good support group around you, but I've learned to fight a lot of battles alone. But, uh, you know, that's it, man. The deprogramming. If you really want to change your life around, you better be prepared to spend time alone to reset. And, uh, you know, the easy way out isn't always the best way. The best way for me has always been the hardest way. Did you ever do therapy? No. I mean, when I was in middle school, my some court-mandated therapist judge or something said I needed to go to a therapist for the divorce said I was a troubled kid in school but I wasn't troubled it was more just well maybe I was I was just you ended up I, I was it. grounded I was grounded as a kid all the time so when you let me out of my cage to go to school of course I'm gonna be a fucking animal imagine locking your dog in a cage all day and then when you let it out of the cage it's gonna fucking run around and bounce off the walls mm-hmm. that was me Maybe you should have took that fairy pill up. You ended up in fucking prison. One of America's biggest weed dealers. <laughs> Maybe the teacher was on to something. There's 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 big dealers that were dealing with the, the Mexican weed, a lot bigger than me. Yeah, of course. A lot bigger. But me, it was a very high-end indoor weed. That's what was unique. I was very big in that arena, and that's the boutique quality weed. See, that organization that you had, did you ever think about doing the... The more darker stuff, the heroin and the cocaine. No, too much prison time. The judge don't like it. Chances are most judges have at least smoked weed once. You know, so when they're standing there looking at somebody like me, look at me. Are you going to put me away for 40 years? Weed. So see, when you get out of prison, what was the plans then? Did you ever think about becoming active again? No, fuck no. No, I, I don't trust. I, I, I don't. I, I assume anybody that comes up to me and tries to ask me anything is wearing a wire or is working. I, there's so many double agents out there. As you get older in the game, you'd be surprised how many double agents. You know, when you're young in your 20s, there's not as many double agents. People haven't gotten busted yet. You know, so I was working from a cleaner slate, but right now I'm red flag for life. You know, it's like I walk a straight line. I don't even jaywalk. Do you not? Yeah, sometimes. But if I'm late for a date. <laughs> <laughs> so how's so that, uh, was it 14 years since you got out? Ah, oh, shit. What year is it? 2023. I got out about nine years ago. How's it been? Lonely. I wrote a book. Writing a book was lonely. But I've had a few good girlfriends. And you know, I've had time... To train, to train for the world I'm getting ready to go into. I'm going back to business. I haven't worked much. I haven't worked like I work. Like I've worked, but I haven't been a leader. Being a leader is a totally different type of work because you need to take care of everybody around you and make sure they all eat. And uh, I'm getting ready to probably be a leader again. Do you feel as if you lost yourself? No, no, I'm more collected than ever. I'm healthy, I'm strong. Uh, you know, I'm a little lonely just because I don't have family, but that's, fuck it. That's, you know, I've accepted that, but uh, I'm uh, I'm excited to have a little fun. You know, I want to work with some cool people. I just want to bring good people in. I don't need to get huge right away. I'm only going to, st- the next endeavor I create will only be a big, as big as the people around me allow it. I'm not going to bring a bunch of people. I only might bring one person in. But hey, if I find 10 good people, I bring 10 people in. I don't know. But I'm not letting. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And I'm not letting any phonies in anymore. I'm not letting any weaklings in. I'm not letting any people that talk shit. Good vibes only. When you come to the table, you better bring good vibes. Yeah. How was it writing your book? Was it easy? The hardest job of my life. Why? Oh, I had to remember shit. I had to learn how to write books. I had to take courses, reading books, structure. It's so hard. Then I had to, some days it would take three hours to write three sentences. And I get frustrated just sitting in front of the computer, man. It was hard. What was the good thing when you were involved in that life? What was the, what was the positives? Positives are never having to look at price tags. Negatives... Or you always have to look over your shoulder. 
Did you ever become a target because you were shifting so much for other no, people? No, because nobody knew how much inventory, nobody knew how much volume I was doing. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody. Everything was a need to know basis. If I do a million dollar deal with you, you don't know that I have two other million dollar deals I have to do later that afternoon. You think you're the only special person in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I like it. Need to know basis. That means if you get busted tomorrow, all you can tell them is what you know what we did. You can tell them nothing else. It's not that. It's the, the police taking your gold and the money. Those fuckers put some in their own pocket as well. I don't know. There's definitely a little bit of money. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that. But yeah, I got I got ran, man. I don't even... I got fucking hammered on. I gave him a ton. But you know, it's the lesson learned. I just... I didn't want to. I didn't want to have to worry about them coming back after me. I didn't want to have to worry about. I just wanted to be able to look in the mirror and start over. Listen, I already made the millions. Millions don't really. All the a lot of the shit you buy is shit. Like like. I do like money. Don't get. But it's just a tool. <laughs> Listen, I want to make millions again. I want to make millions again. But the, the money is just for me to build and create more i don't personally need millions just the businesses that i create need millions to move because i like that's my game like it's my sport i like to connect dots and make shit happen but personally even when i make millions when i was making millions before i didn't have any furniture in my house i didn't give a fuck what the fuck i'm not gonna sit down i don't have time to sit down i had a bed i had a bed and a chef that's it that's it and i work and a drawer full of condoms yeah, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> How much you were paying me? You know, the clean ones are more expensive. Uh, it depends. I don't know. I don't like to get too much into that. You prevent me from having a wife ever. You talk like that. <laughs> no, it's um, but like you say, you talk about family life. I feel as if I feel as if kids are never. There's never a right moment to have a family or kids, but when they do it, it's a blessing from God to say, "Okay, this is your time. This is your time to," because it. I feel as if we're all selfish. I feel as if we're all <clears throat> confused and lost. And it's the only time is when you have a family is the only time you realise there's things outside of you that are greater and more important. Because people who don't have a family, no matter what they say, it's all they ever want to feel loved. In my own opinion, with the people I interview, I understand where's the loss of connection and pretending because... If you're loved, there's no better feeling in the world. That's why we don't get into so many relationships, man. Because the fucking loss of a relationship is the most painful thing in the world. I've lost countless family members and friends to murder and suicide. And losing a, a relationship from someone that you love, phew, that's a hundred times more painful. Because as men, we're great pretenders. We pretend we're okay. We pretend it doesn't hurt. But fuck me. It's... I'll never get into another relationship. And then you'll tend to see you just sleeping around or partying, pretending you're okay, but you're just wishing you were with them again. I haven't lost... I haven't lost anybody really close to me. I haven't lost a sibling. I haven't lost a parent. I haven't lost a girlfriend to death. So I haven't experienced, I haven't experienced that type of loss yet. Do you think that's because... You don't let them in, though? No, I'm just I'm young. I don't, I, I'm only 44. I mean, the people that are my immediate family. Well, I'm talking about relationships. Are you always guarded with them? Are you vulnerable? Oh, I don't, I'm not vulnerable. I'm guarded, man. I've been burned. I'm a survival. I'm, I'm on earth to survive. Really, it is. It's sad to say. It's the one embarrassing. It's, my life's about survival. Wake up, make sure there's enough food on the table. That's it. And if, that, and, and if you can have some fun, that's a bonus. What's your daily routine like now? Wake up. Check email. Look at the sun first to reset my circadian rhythm. A couple full glasses of room temperature water check emails do all my alone and creative work the first two hours of the day that's where my brain's calm and quiet and then this afternoon is when i take the meetings the calls make shit happen implement stuff evening workout eat farm to table foods and then uh relax whether it's scroll on my phone reads news articles Flip on a TV show, which I never watch TV, maybe a couple times a year. Um, talk to a girlfriend. Um, 
and then plan my next day. And then I tape my mouth shut when I go to bed. It's helped. Yo, you ever done that? No, but I, I'm looking at things where you go blindfolded as well yeah. and don't see for three days, five days. Apparently, it aligns everything back in your body and it heightens all your senses. When you, It's like I'm... I'm like a blindfold you oh, were yeah. for like five days. So, <clears throat> yeah. But apparently taking your mouth makes you sleep better as well. Is that yeah, correct? it just forces you to breathe through your nose. Mm-hmm. It's helped. I've, I sleep deep. You know, if I if I have good cardio exercise and I take my mouth, a good meal, I'll sleep straight without turning too much. And that's really helps because you can have the healthiest diet and do all the new trends and fads, but if you're not locking in top shelf sleep to really – reset your body at the cellular level you're you're never going to completely heal so you can thrive and get to the next level you seem to have went down the spiritual route is that always something you've been involved in or is it more because you're getting older you're starting to look into life a bit more i grew up near nature so i I ate mushrooms at a very young age in college and i've eaten mushrooms a few hundred times and it's Every time I eat them, I usually do it in nature, and they help. They help connect me to source, reset, barefoot grounding, swimming, like all these things, and being thankful. Mushrooms are a miracle. They really could heal the world uh, if taken properly. You don't want to abuse them. Like I don't microdose. A lot of people are eating these things every day. I'm like, how do you do that? Like, how do you replenish your serotonin levels? You know, how do you come back to ground zero? You know, so I, I don't take them off, and it's been months for me, but uh, I would. There's been times where I've taken them, you know, three, four, five days straight, and that's always been a party. You know, and get to a point where you're like, shit, <laughs> what day is it? You know what I'm saying? You know, it's fun. I, I just don't do that anymore. But But mushrooms in nature have really taught me what's important. Touching the tree and feeling it at the how alive it is and how it's real and feeling the wind on my face. Like those types of things, I've mushrooms has helped me be more sensitive to my environment and really helped me understand what truth is. You know, we're taught so much shit, man, but it's like there's one thing in life that never goes out of style, and remember this, and that's nature. It's never going to go out of style, but all the other shit you build, the house or this new car or this new purse, it's all going to go out of style. So it's like, for me, I go into the places, nature, and that's that trail I walked down and run in yesterday, that I ran in yesterday, it still looks the same and feels the same as it did 20 years ago when I did. It feels the smell from the forest charges me and heals me. The wind leaves on my face, cleanse me. Like, you know, you can go get a hot stone massage or a clay scrub, and spend 500 bucks and be trapped in a concrete building under LED lights, doing your red light therapy and your infrared, hanging upside down, all that shit. But for me personally, it still doesn't be be being barefoot in a freshwater stream with the sun beating down on you. Like right there, I mean, that's, that's uh, God's gift, I guess, of, whatever god there may be i guess what is there over like six thousand religions in the world i don't even know yeah, but five thousand gods and whatever. yeah but what do you think life is eric that's i don't have the answer to that <clears throat> to me to me life is about really being present today and being thankful for what i have and trying to treat everybody around me the same way i would want to be treated which is hard at times i can't tell you there's some people that i just want to there's some people that have hurt me in the past, you know, that to just wish them well is a difficult thing. I don't, actually I don't even think about them. Some of them I don't. But you asked the question, what is life about? Life is about, for me personally, just being present now, being able to adapt to my environment. Life's so short, dude. That building can fall down right now on top of us. I've seen the white light. I've been in the helicopter, rushed to the hospital twice. Once I collapsed the lung, broke 11 ribs. Another time I caught on fire and I've laid there on the bed being like, oh, and it was one of those times where I said, all right, today's the day. This is it. I'm all done. And I really thought I was like, I'm not coming back out of this one. I'm going to be paralyzed or something like this is all. It's all I had my run. What happened? I hit a tree skiing. I 
collapsed lung, broke all my ribs on the left, 11 ribs. And I just couldn't move, man. I was deflated. I was just looking up at the sky, down in a ditch, hoping somebody would hear me yell. And it was just like, fuck it. I'm, it's over. Game over. You did it. You had, you had a good run. Life goes quick. You know, and then eventually, I mean, I knew, I kind of eventually was like, okay, I'm going to get out of this, but it was just like, it was painful. Like I couldn't yell. I didn't have the breath to do it. I didn't, I was just fucked. And the other time I caught on fire, I poured five gallons of gasoline in the woods on a brush pile on my property and nobody was around. I have 40 acres and I ran a long trail of gas in the main pile, but it blew up so big and it blew back probably 60 feet and I caught on fire and my whole left side, I have pictures I'll show you after I was, I was all burned up and I jumped in the pond and I got my phone, called my stepfather. He said, call 911. The ambulance came, but then they sent a helicopter, flew me somewhere. And it was just, you know, you just sit there in those hospitals and you're just like, fuck, man. What a, I don't do crazy shit anymore. I live a very healthy, simple life, low impact. Like, I don't do anything crazy. I'm not doing high speed shit. Like, I'm just trying to do the basics now, how to walk properly. Like when I run, I run for 20 minutes and then I'll run backwards for five minutes, trying to get to activate all my muscles just so I'm agile and stay young. Very simple life. I'm, I'm very simple life and I want to help the younger kids. I have kids that read my book now that call me or email me or DM me like, hey, I really read your book. It changed my life. Can you help me? That feels good to have a 21-year-old kid reach out to me and be like, yo, your book's changed my life. I, I need some help. Like, that feels good. I'm like, fuck yeah. You know, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a great feeling that I never knew existed. Does it make you more scared of life, having near-death experiences where you're more aware of the choices that you make now? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't do people. I always think twice before I say yes to anything. So no skydiving? No, nah, I don't like skydiving. <clears throat> I get bored. I, I just, I like to stay on the ground. I like to stay on the ground, be agile on my feet. Like I want to take a, I want to learn a few things. I want a few little, some, maybe a little martial arts. Maybe, I don't know. Just some basic things, protect myself. Somebody says, give me all your money. What the fuck are you thinking when you're on fire? <laughs> Yo, was your, that, was it's your, fucking painful, dude. <laughs> dude, that is being on fire is the most hair, painful thing. Oh, I stuff? smelled my all my <laughs> hair, all the body and my all the hair on my body. That's the first thing that went. You smell it, go that sound. Yeah, it's fucking. It's just I was fighting with my girlfriend at the time. I didn't sleep three days. I was making poor choices. I was fucking both times I was in the hospitals because I didn't sleep the days before. And when you don't sleep, I don't care how fucking powerful you are. You're not going to make clear choices, mm -hmm. clear decisions. It's like proper sleep is essential. You know, you can run around drinking Red Bulls, banging lines of Coke and all that shit, but it's going to catch up with you. Yeah. A million percent, man. It's not the shit that they put in cocaine now anyway, with petrol, fucking rat poison, cement. It's just oil. It's just mixed with absolute shit. I had a drug lord on. He was saying they put tires in it tires for cars and what happens is that causes cancer in the brain people snort snorting fucking cancer basically crazy crazy just for the weight they put it in but it causes cancer i'm glad i don't do drugs anymore i'd be scared of all the shit that's out there yeah so where do you go forward for the future eric what's your plans Listen. i know you want to do the the outdoor stuff but where's your visions tell me my, that's it my vision is i'm going to create a new way of living for people I'm going to create a new way of living, you know, and I'm going to create an ecosystem that works. Think like Tesla has a whole ecosystems with charging all over the country or Apple has an ecosystem, the iCloud, where it all works. I'm going to create an ecosystem for living where you sleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm really going to map it out. And the only way I can map it out is I have to clear my plate of everything. That means even these interviews, like I need to like totally get down to basics, like just working out, eating right, and not taking phone calls of bullshit. And just like, really, I'm gonna map out the plan. And then once it's mapped out A to Z and all the dots connect and make sense, then I'm gonna put my team together to execute it. Yeah, is that the plan then? Healthy life, just getting people who are disconnected to connect again to their true presence, their true powers, their true source? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and I wanna help people because 
the fuck we're gonna run through uh life like a bunch of slaves <clears throat> buying shit to keep up with the masses look at all this clever marketing all these billboards out here telling us to buy all this shit we don't need all this shit it makes me tired I had it all. I had all those shoes, belts. I didn't have time to wear them. I didn't even know the names of them. They had tags on them. I didn't even use it. I don't have fucking time for that shit. I want to enjoy life, right? You want to you want to eat good, sleep good, and you want love. You want love. You want to be loved. Why do you have 500 pairs of shoes? You have 500 pairs of shoes because you want people to say you're cool. You don't need 500 pairs of shoes. You don't have other fuck. You have to put those on. You know how much work that is to put on 500 pairs of shoes? Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> What's, uh, would, you, would you change anything from your past uh, change anything from my past I'd probably be more compassionate for people around me there were times when I was younger when I thought I was maybe I didn't say it I might have subconsciously thought I was the only one that had hard times everybody that you look at right now is fighting a battle that you may know nothing about yeah okay everybody I always say this, man, but everybody does struggle. No matter if you're the truck driver, the train driver, the billionaire, the millionaire, the homeless man. I've interviewed homeless men. And some of them are happier than the people who's got millions. It's fucking crazy. It's just the way you see the world. Everybody's controls how they think and feel, but it's hard if you've been wired up wrong for so many years in that abusive relationship, in that job you hate, never feeling good enough, battling with weight, battling with addiction, battling with suicidal thoughts. It's crazy. And one thing, <clears throat> because this is Men's Mental Health Month, and it's mad because all the men on this planet have all got a special superpower, I believe. And that special superpower is, no matter if they're going through a relationship breaker or they're battling with addiction or battling with their weight or battling with money, every man on this planet has a power, and that power is they have a smile on their face when their whole world is shattering within Every single man, that's what we're amazing at. That's special superpower. I don't even know if it's a positive, though, because it's sad to think that we all pretend we're happy, we've got it figured out, but we're all fucking scared and vulnerable and <clears throat> trying to do the right things and constantly competing and constantly thinking, am I good enough? Do they like me? Do I fit in? It's stripping all that back and trying to figure out that you're fucking nobody's got it figured out basically we just do not I, I always say this as well but everybody on this planet everybody i've interviewed no matter who it is everybody's got one thing in common as well male and female nobody has it figured out yeah. we just want to go through life content at peace happy but it's not natural as well because bad shit always happens huh yeah yeah you gotta bad shit does happen a lot and but good stuff happens also yeah, the, the ebbs and flows of life, you know. I'm on an upswing. I feel it. You feel I know. The chef I've been coming. On, oh yeah, it's coming. It's coming. I'm going on an upswing here for the next. I have a good stretch, some years ahead of me. That's going to be a nice upswing. I've been laying low. The last ten years have been very reflective, steady, plateaued, eat some downhills. Yeah, I'm all. I'm going for the upswing. I'm just going to have a good time doing it. Hopefully, stay healthy, centered, help some people along the way, and uh, you know. There's a lot of pressure out there, though, right? Yeah. You know what's pressure? I feel bad for these kids. Social media platforms. Mm -hmm. I don't like how they put... You have to understand, I don't like... And I've said this before. I don't like that a lot of our social media platforms were created by antisocial people. Think about what that's doing to the kids. You got to post a picture, and then you got to wait there to see how many likes you get. And if you don't get a certain amount of likes, you might not feel special. You might not feel validated. My opinion, if you get one like, you're fucking winning, right? You don't need everybody to like you. If you have everybody liking you, you're doing something wrong. You're not pushing hard enough. You're being a snow, you're being a, you're being a chameleon. It's important that these young kids know that not everybody needs to like you. Mm -hmm. It's very important they know that. Stay true to who you are. If you have one good friend, hold on to them dearly. What's the biggest life lesson you have learned? being on this planet ah oh, very simple you're a product for your environment so choose everything around you wisely whether it's the bed you sleep on the water you drink the people you go to dinner with be very careful for anybody that's watching that's want to get involved in a life of crime eric what advice would you have for them if you want to get involved in a life of crime uh 
make sure it's your last resort. I got involved literally, and you'll see this in the book, because I was ready to jump and kill myself at age 16. I really was out of options, bro. I didn't know where to go sleep that was safe, where I wouldn't be abused, and I didn't know where to get food, because I had to go home and face the abuse. I was scared. So I had to, uh, to me, my option was like sell weed to make enough money and do it quietly so I don't get caught. I didn't want to sell weed. Are you kidding me? I wanted to be an architect. Like that was my dream. But if you wanted to be in a life of crime, number one, don't do it. And number two, if you're going to do it, you better have an exit plan. You better not even tell your best friends what you're doing. You better be on a need to know basis. But it's problem is most people get caught. It's the, the people I know that haven't get caught. They were very slow and steady, quietly. They have legal businesses. They just, they just, they're not greedy. They do little things here and there, but they're still not even living their hundred percent passion or purpose. So I don't know. I don't think, I don't think people should be getting into the life of crime. Now, if, if you're going to do it, if you're going to get in the life of crime, don't call me and don't come around me. Cause I don't want any of your heat coming on me. Yeah. Do you think that's why you, you've struggled through the years as well because you went through as a kid? Uh, oh, yeah, man. Product, my childhood was my childhood was scary, lonely, and painful. My childhood was way harder than prison for me. Yeah, it's, my, my childhood was... I don't even want to talk about it. There's nothing to talk about it. It's over with. It's the past. It made me who I am. It made me strong enough to be able to handle the real world, right? Like there's not much that can break me in the real world. I'm ready for pain and problems every day. And I'm a very good problem solver because of all the stuff I had to overcome as a young kid. So I'm the type of guy that you call, if you have a problem, I can probably help you solve it pretty quickly. For anybody that's watching, it's maybe been... <clears throat> And a life of abuse as a young age and don't know how it got over it, what advice would you have for them? Oh, my God. That's a hard one, man. Advice to get over abuse. It's really tough. I mean, because where do you go? What do you do? I had the man on yesterday who was a producer of Sound of Freedom. He says one in four go through abuse in their life. One in four people on this planet. That's two billion people. You gotta you have to you have to sit down quietly with a pen and paper and write a plan. Use blue ink and write white paper without lines and write bullet points every single day of steps on how to overcome your problem. Every day, write it down and, and just make sure you focus on the most important. Make sure you have good, healthy food and a warm place to sleep. Everything else, don't spend money on anything. Not on video games, not on Cheez-Its, popcorn, nothing that does not fuel you to get out of your shitty situation. Eric, would you like to finish up on anything else? Yeah, I really hope uh, I really hope some younger kids will read my book. And if you read it and you like it, you send me a DM on Instagram. Where and can people be get your book? On Amazon. Uh, the Amazon UK, they should have it too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazon is probably the best place to get it. It's Pressure, memoir by Eric Canori. Uh, if you like it, DM me. Um, and let's have some fun. What can? How can people contact you if they watch this podcast? Want to reach out? Maybe struggling Instagram. Yourself? Just this, your name as well, Eric, Eric Canori. Yep, Eric Canori. C A N O R I. What about Twitter, TikTok? I, they like can. That? I don't check all that stuff. I'm pretty good at checking. I'm on. I have an account on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, but. I'm not going to be posting much right now. This year, I won't be posting much because I need to go into the space and really create. Detox? I, yeah, not detox. I'm going into a place of creativity, and I need to, like, I can't be worried about interacting on social media. But I will respond to DMs all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, brother, would you like to finish up on anything? I'm done, man, bro. Let's get I'm This is it. This is my last words, period, of all this past in my life. You are witnessing right now me leaving the old life. Well, we can do another podcast in five years talking about the new life then. Yeah. Brother, listen, Thank I you wish you all the best for the future. Thank Thoroughly you. enjoyed your conversation. Yeah. All the best. You've got a friend in me. Anytime you ever need me, mate, I'm always be there. So, Appreciate listen, it. God bless you, brother. Appreciate it.